giving um, this morning, uh, this morning's webinar on COVID-19 and the immune response. Um, so uh, just wanted to uh, say that uh, this is uh, going to be based on both in general knowledge of what we understand so far about COVID-19 and the immune response and also uh, results from um, research in my own uh, laboratory group. Um, in terms of questions, if you have questions, you can use the chat function for your questions. Um, please keep in mind that I'm, a, I'm an immunologist, I'm a scientist. Um, I do not see patients, so if you need advice on how to treat your patients, I, I'm not going to be able to ask those, address those questions, um, but I will be able to address any questions you have on, uh, on the immune response, on COVID-19, or respiratory viruses, and uh, as we'll talk about today. Um, so uh, I really don't need this introductory slide. Uh, this is uh, COVID-19. It's an infectious disease that we've been living with uh, in the U.S. Uh, now for the past 10 months, really, really almost a year. Um, it's caused by infection with a novel, highly transmissible coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. It's resulted in a worldwide pandemic. Yeah, we just have to update the slide really weekly. Uh, now we have almost 96 million people have been infected worldwide, over 24 million in the U.S., and over 1.3 million in the state of New York. Um, as you know, that the infection with this virus causes a variety of different outcomes, depending on uh, the individual. Uh, it can be asymptomatic, mostly in children and some younger adults, and they'll get, the, they'll get infected, but they really won't show overt symptoms. Most people will get a self-limited disease. It's also called a mild disease, but it doesn't feel that mild if you have it. It doesn't have pneumonia, but you get a dry cough, persistent fever, and fatigue, body aches. It can really last a week. So this is uh, not like your average flu-type illness. It's just much worse. Um, a certain percentage will develop severe disease. Severe disease from this uh, infection is a respiratory illness. Uh, it causes damage to the rocks. So you can have uh, your oxygen saturation drop below uh, that kind of critical, critical uh, threshold, not 50%, but it can get very low in people who are severely ill. It can progress to acute respiratory distress syndrome, or AODS, to multi-organ failure and death. Uh, the risk factors for this severe disease are older age, uh, male, and also comorbidities like type of diabetes and obesity. Um, most children don't develop this severe respiratory disease, but there is a severe disease manifestation in children, uh, which was identified actually initially here at Air Presbyterian. It's called the multi-inflammatory syndrome, uh, or MISC. It's a systemic inflammation. It does it can or it may not include respiratory uh, symptom, symptoms. Uh, but there is cardiac involvement, uh, such as ventricular dysfunction. It's readily treated with steroids, um, but it is a very rare yeah, this is a severe disease in children. Uh, right now, uh, the mortality is about 2% or so, um, all cause, uh, although that's uh, difficult to assess because a lot of asymptomatic infections go unreported. Uh, there'll be been over 2 million deaths worldwide, and of course, over 400,000 deaths last. So this is quite devastating. Uh, and thousands of people are dying uh, each day. Uh, the treatment is supportive care. Uh, there are new vaccines. I'm going to talk about them again. So there's a lot of questions then that the uh, that this disease brings up, and particularly uh, the immune response, because right now our only defense, um, until this vaccine really kicks in, our only defense against this new virus is our immune system. Uh, so it's important that we understand all different aspects of the immune system and how it's different in different individuals that might. Uh, that might result in different outcomes. So today what I want to do is go over um, sort of aspects of key aspects of immune response to a respiratory virus. And then what is the nature of this immune response to this virus, SARS-CoV-2, across different clinical manifestations and age. Um, and then talk about what are the immune process involved in severe COVID-19. I mean, what is the efficacy? And then to end uh, with the discussion of what are the vaccines and what's the efficacy of the current COVID-19 vaccines and how they work. So a lot of what we know about the antiviral immune response, uh, it derives from studies in influenza virus and mostly in, in animal models. And these have been, uh, these are high, these are modeled very closely on what happens to 
uh, influenza when, when humans get it. And so we know a lot about the time course and the different stages of the immune response to infection. So initially, when the virus infects, and doing a relative level on the, on the y-axis of the time course infection on the x-axis. So the initial response to the virus, remember the virus will infect, and all the viruses uh, replicate exponentially. They get into the cells, and they use the cell machinery to replicate. Uh, and then you have like this burst of each cell gives rise to many, many new viruses. So in that way, it can exponentially uh, replicate. So that within each cell, and also in cells with the innate immune system, there are what we call the innate immune response, including type 1 interferons that are produced by the infected cell, as well as innate immune cells and macrophages and monocytes. Um, and these are that initial early response. This will block and inhibit viral replication within a cell, as well as set up inflammatory and, and inflammatory cytokines to again have that early uh, control of the virus. But it's not sufficient to control the virus, so we need our adaptive immune system. Our adaptive immune system, which consists of T cells and B cells, which make antibodies, is absolutely essential to our host response to the virus. So the virus-specific T cells, including C14 helper cells, and cytotoxic CD8 cells become activated. They're triggered by components of the innate immune response that will present the viral antigens to the T cells. The T cells will become activated. They will expand. And you see that they're expanded. Again, this is quite this is exponential expansion of the C4 and C8 cells. Um, these cells will go, as I'll show you, to the lung. It's there where they'll coordinate. The CD8 cells will kill the virally infected cells. Um, the CD4 cells will also go to the lung, and some will also interact with B cells to promote antibody formation. The antibodies are specific to the virus. So all of these immune reactants are, is, is for the adaptive immune response, are very are, are kind of reaching their peak levels even after the virus is cleared. So all of these T cells and B cells are acting to clear the virus in a virus-specific way. When the virus is cleared, these, uh, the T cells, many of them will die. But the antibody will persist in the plasma and serum. The T cells will contract, but they will keep a proportion of virus specific C8 and C4 cells as memory cells, as well as the antibody. And these are kind of the preformed memory response to that virus that will last for, could be months, even years in your body. And these will provide protective immunity if you see that virus again. So let's look a little closer in the case of respiratory virus. So you have the flu flu or respiratory infection into the being inhaled in the lung. It's picked up by the epithelial cells as well as by the dendritic cells that are in that lung. And, then, and the, these cells will give that innate immune response. The dendritic cells will also migrate to the, the um, draining lymph node. This is your lymphoid tissue. will present and activate virus-specific T cells. You can call them naive T cells because they've never seen virus. They become activated. They differentiate. So vector cells, the endocrinal expansion, these will produce a number of cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines, that will coordinate viral clearance in the lung. So they go to the lung. These effector cells need to go to the lung to mediate viral clearance. So they're going to kill virally infected cells, or they're going to uh, produce cytokines that will kill these virally infected cells. So you have some of these are going to differentiate the cytotoxic T lymphocyte to kill the virally infected cells. And then also, some of the infector cells will go to the neighboring lymphoid tissue, where they will help B cells to differentiate into antibody-secreting plasma cells. The antibody will then go again to the lung and, and, and will go to different sites, will bind to the virus and mark it for further destruction. So by these multiple mechanisms, the adaptive immune response coordinates virus-specific clearance. So this is how you get rid of the new virus. It's the T cells and the antibodies and multiple mechanisms. The T cells will kill the virally infected cells, prevent the spread of virus. The antibodies will mark any leftover virus that's not killed in the cell. This will mop up the virus and mark it for destruction by, uh, by complement mediated mechanisms as well as by macrophages. So afterwards, what's left? So what's left, if you have these virus-specific antibodies and memory cells, they can provide protective immunity. They can't always provide protective immunity, but we know that there are certain types of antibodies 
that will add cheap cells that will provide protective immunity. So what are the protective antibodies? The protective antibodies are what we call neutralizing antibodies. They're neutralizing because they bind to the virus and prevent the virus from infecting the cell. So they can prevent this infection by really blocking the virus receptor that the, the receptor the virus needs to bind to and enter the cell, or they can block it's engulfing because normally these viruses are taken out into the cell, and so they can bind sort of, um, they can block that entry mechanisms of the virus into the cell. So neutralizing antibodies block infection. Because they block infection, um, they're really a great target for vaccines because then you won't get infected. If you block infection, the virus has nowhere to go. The virus can't replicate in the cell, and you, you're the reservoir for the virus to be infected. Um, so if you can't be the reservoir, then you also can't spread the virus. What about T cells? So not all antibodies are neutralizing antibodies, only a subset are, and I'll show you this in a little bit. What about protective T cells? So protective T cells are the T cells that remain in the lung. So after, as I showed you, in order for T cells to coordinate clearance and get rid of those virally infected cells in the lung, they need to be in the lung. They need to be in that site. After the virus is cleared, a subset of these T cells, these virus specific T cells that have gone to the lung, stay in the lung. And they actually uh, hang out around airways. This is a lung staining. This is a mouse, but um, it, it, we can also see this in humans that these, uh, what we call tissue resident memory or TRM, these are tissue resident memory cells, they congregate and they are situated around the airways. And these will mediate very rapid clearance of the virus because any virus that's entering the airway that you're going to breathe in, they are at the site. And this is results on previous results in my lab as we identified these tissue resident memory cells in the lung. We found that mice that only had tissue resident memory in the lung were fully protected from lethal challenge, whereas mice that had circulating memory cells. So circulating memory cells are the ones that you can detect with blood. But these are not necessarily protected. And, and in fact, if you just had circulating, you weren't really well protected from lethal challenge. If you didn't have any T cells, you also weren't protected from lethal challenge. So it's neutralizing antibodies and tissue resident memory at the site that are going to provide that protective immunity that we need. Okay? Now, what about COVID 19? So, COVID 19 is not flu. Some people don't clear very well, some people get very ill. So the whole um, kinetics of that response is really shifted. And it shifted depending on what kind of symptoms people have. So you have that early re uh, viral replication, and you will have an innate immune response. Um, now, that innate immune response can control that viral infection, and then you get this kind of mild disease. But in cases when you can't control the viral replication, this innate immune response doesn't really know to quit because it's still seeing virus. You will get adaptive immunity, so you'll get uh, T cells and you'll get antibodies, but they tend to be more extended in terms of um, when you can measure them during an acute response. So depending on the nature of the disease, the kinetics of the innate immune response and the T and B cell response may be extended in COVID-19. So what about um, the difference? So how does the immune response relate to the disease severity and also relate to age? Because we know that many children do not get severe disease. And in fact, many of them don't get disease at all. And we don't understand why that is. Now, children are particularly adapted to see new responses. So every, most viruses that children see, especially young children, are new. And that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to respond to new viruses. They have lots of new naive T cells. Adults, however, we've generated memory over our lifetimes. Usually, a lot of it's generated in childhood. When you get scared many times, you'll generate that memory, you'll get vaccines. And so, we're really relying on our memory responses to protect them. However, SARS CoV 2 is a new pathogen. So, we have the memory, so we're a little bit crippled with that, right? Because we don't really have memory of cells for each So we have to generate new responses, which we can do. It just takes a little longer. Children are adapted to recognize new, new, and new viruses. And they seem to be doing well. So what we did, um, and this was a study that we did, um, and a lot of collaborators. Um, so this is a study that just uh, is published, actually, this issue of nature immunology this month, uh, published a few months ago online. Uh, Stu Weisberg, uh, in pathology, and Tom Connors, from pediatrics, led this study. Our collaborators were Matteo Parado 
in pediatrics, Matt Baldwin in, um, in medicine, and Olga Hode uh, from pathology. So we had four cohorts. We had adults with mild disease, which we obtained from these convalescent plasma donors. Uh, these were people who were non hospitalized and recovered and actually had donated plasma um, for those early studies. This is, this is, most of these were recruited in the first surge in the spring. Um, and then we had adults with severe COVID-19 and ARDS, so these were in the ICU. We also had samples from children with multi-inflammatory syndrome. This is when they were acutely seen in the pediatric ICU. And then we also had from the biobank, children with asymptomatic or mild disease. These were captured uh, by the Columbia University Biobank because anybody that was hospitalized uh, during the spring, this is last spring and summer, um, that were hospitalized for other causes like they needed, they had appendicitis or, or they broke their leg or for, uh, for psychiatric reasons, uh, they were given a, a test and also a serology. And if they had a positive test, virus test, and sort of to a serology, they had evidence of, and they were infected. Uh, they had either asymptomatic or mild disease. So we had these four cohorts. We looked at their antibody response. So in this cohort, mostly in this publication, mostly with the antibody response, uh, specific for different viral proteins. So we have different viral proteins. One is that spike, this is the virus. The spike protein is how the virus gets into the cells. So it's a good target for neutralizing antibodies. This is a kind of a close up of the spike protein, and this is the receptor binding domain. This is what actually enables it to get into the respiratory, the cell of the respiratory tract. Um, um, but there's another protein called this nucleocapsid protein that also you can generate a new response in antibodies directed against. And this is an internal protein. So you only see this protein when the infection is widely disseminated, where there's a lot of dying cells. The cell you release on these internal proteins in the virus. Uh, and that's how you can, uh, and so there'll be antibodies to the to the end protein. So we looked at spike and end protein. We looked at, especially for spike, IgG and IgM. IgM is the initial type of antibody. So all antibodies are immunoglobulins. IgM is the first type of antibody produced. IgG is produced a little bit later in infection and also in the memory response. We also mentioned that neutralizing the spike protein, again, inhibition of virus infection, which is done in vitro offset. And so what we found overall, so here are the cohorts. We have adults and we have pediatrics. And adults, again, are the mild of the CPD for the COVID ARDS. The pediatrics are either MISC, that's severe, or non-MISC would be the, um, the cohort that did with asymptomatic or mild. And what we found, and this is anti-SIGG, this is anti-SIGM. So overall, what we found is that the children had, um, well, for anti-SIGG, the, the children basically had uh, levels of IgG for the anti-S protein that was similar to adults for anti-S IgG, but lower than for the severe, the cohort with severe disease. The cohort with severe disease always had the highest levels of virus-specific antibody. But when you look at the other subclass of the antibody, the IgM, the adults had IgM, but the children really didn't have measurable IgM. And also, if you look at the other specificity, which kind of signals if there's an active infection, the nucleic capsid antibodies. The adults had good levels of nucleocapsid antibodies, but the children didn't. You can compare to, um, this is plasma samples from pre-pandemic controls. Okay. So they, they don't have any of the antibodies. So children overall have a lower level of antibodies, particularly anti-SIGM antibodies and anti-NIGG. And that the group, the adults with the most severe infection, had the highest level of antibodies across the board. Um, now, were these age dependent? So, because we found differences in children versus adults, we wanted to see was this age association or the difference as a function of age, was it continuous or was it really in that two groups? And so, what we found, and if you look at the end, it's the most informative. So, the children across the board, and these are both all the pediatric, and, and we, we have here, oh, this is 46 children here. And you can see that no matter if they were young children or older children, really, really adults, 18 year olds, um, they really had a low, very low levels of this anti antibodies. And for the adults, the young adults had, had anti S antibodies, but it was lower than the older adults. And so that was sort of this age association of anti -M antibodies, but it was really that cutoff point. It was this kind of discrete difference that if you're a child, you didn't have very high anti -M antibodies. 
Um, and there was a similar uh, difference. So if you saw the difference in anti-SIGG, again, there wasn't much of an age association. That was pretty much similar for children and adults, but it was really, that really depends on the uh, clinical severity. And adults with the most severe COVID had the highest levels of anti-SIGG, um, and it really didn't change the stop significant, it really didn't change the age. So it seemed like there was a real age dependence for anti-NIGG, both it was really low and probably non-existent as a child, and then younger adults had lower levels of the anti-NIGG um, than the older adults. What about neutralizing activity? So the way you measure neutralizing activity is you do this in in vitro assay, that you have an infection of cells and you type it in different concentrations in the serum, and you look for inhibition of that infection. So that the, the more that it titrates out here, so that this is now the dilution, the plasma dilution factor, and this is the percent inhibition. So you can see for the COVID, for the, for the negative control, um, you, you see that, that there's any inhibitions that are nonspecific, it, it dilutes right out at the first dilution, okay? But for the, uh, for the plasma, for the most severe adult patients, you can see that you, you need many dilutions to actually dilute out the inhibitory effect. And here's a patient where it's very, very high neutralized activity. And interestingly, this patient did die. Um, so some of the highest neutralized activity you get to this virus doesn't necessarily correlate with survival. It just means you've been sick for a really long time. And then the, co the adult convalescent plasma there, which here's the two adult group, also had very good neutralizing activity. But you can see that for the children, for both groups, that you really diluted out your neutral activity quite um, really at the lowest dilution. So if you look at now you kind of integrate all that and get a, a neutralizing activity, you can see that both children, both groups of children have lower neutralizing activity uh, than the adults. And so here's the adults with mild disease and, was, and the children's a neutralized activity it was significantly different than the, uh, than the adults with mild disease, and then uh, was also uh, much lower than the adults with severe disease in their skin. Okay. So children have reduced neutralizing activity. Um, now what about the T-cell response? Um, so uh, this is uh, this T-cell assay was developed by uh, Shane Cry and Alex Seppi at McGuire Institute. They published a number of papers looking at this virus-specific T-cell response. Now, unlike antibodies, where it's a little bit more readily sampled than measured, it's a little harder to measure the T-cell response. First, it's very rare, and second, you have to use a lot of, you have to actually stimulate them and look for a response from your virus-specific T-cell. And the way you can look at a response is by slow cytometry. So you look at the expression of multiple markers of activation that are expressed in the surface of the T-cell, that indicate that that T cell is activated. And that T cell will only be activated by virus, virus uh, SARS-CoV-2 peptides if that T cell is specific for the virus. So here's the negative control. And they have uh, three groups unexposed, acute who are hospitalized, so some of these people have severe disease, and then convalescent who are about three weeks post symptom. These were people, this is like our convalescent plasma donor. This is very similar to the cohorts that I just showed you uh, for the adults. Uh, where they've recovered from mild disease. You can see the unexposed, this is the negative control, so you, don't, you can see you're looking for the T cells that appear in this kind of blue square here that are expressing these activation markers. And so in the unexposed, you don't get many T cells that are um, reactive to the virus. In the acute, you get uh, quite a few. Um, so you see it's a really nice response. And this is to different proteins. This is to the S protein, it's really probably the highest response. And you also get to the N protein, this is the matrix protein. So that the hospitalized patients have really good uh, T cell response, and the convalescent, you also maintain this T cell response. Okay? And if you quantitate, you can see that there's kind of a wide variation. And if you look at the percentage, it's very low. So most of these people, it's less than 1% of the T cells in the blood are actually responding to the virus. And that's pretty typical for an acute, uh, acute viral infection. You don't have high levels of these T cells. And you can see in the people who are acutely ill that the T cell response, sometimes you can measure it and sometimes you can't. So there's wide variation. You know, this is for C4 cell. This is all T helper cell. So we have applied this T cell assay. This is really work in progress. But just to show you just some quality of early data that we have, and again, this is lo looking at um, the T cell responses, um, looking at activation markers. And again, we're looking in that square. So here's the controls. 
We have adults and we have two children. This is just two examples of a child with MIC and a child who just was exposed, but really asymptomatic. Now, we're much further out with infections, so we're, we're months past infection. So you see the adult, um, although it's a very low, it's a very measurable C4 and a much lower CD8 response that you can measure. This is an adult who was um, not hot, well, I think only briefly hospitalized for one day, but really had uh, a bad illness but recovered. And it didn't require support of care or anything. Um, this is the MISC child again. It has a nice or some measurable response, it's lower than the adult. And here's a child um, who didn't really get sick but was exposed to it, had uh, seen the virus, and there, there was CD4 response. Again, measurable, much lower. And again, the CD8 responses are pretty low. You can also look at cytokines. So remember that when I showed in the beginning that this protective response requires the production of these receptor cytokines so you can direct clearance. Now these are, again, very, you can measure them. They're very low frequency. So you have to look here. And get, you can just see it's only a few dots. But the adults, again, nine months post infection, have a measurable C8 effector response that's producing interferon and TNF. These are cytotoxic T cells, so this has, that means this person has um, memory T cells that could potentially mediate effector function against this virus, as well as C4 cells. The child with MINC has very few, and the child that doesn't have, um, didn't get really ill, has almost none. Now, we're, we're doing this in progress. We have multiple cohorts. We're now doing these from children and adults. But just to say an example that, again, the severity of illness in this case uh, really correlated with the, with the extent of the T cell response. So just to summarize this part, adults and children generate a virus that adapt adapted to response to T cell and antibodies. But the uh, children, in terms of the antibodies, they use a reduced antibody response. It depends on the disease severity. Suggested they reduced infection, of course, particularly the lack of anti N. Suggested that this infection, maybe it's, it's getting into the cell, but it's really not spread throughout the body. Um, so we know from the symptoms that it's really not uh, getting into the lungs and really spreading that way. And um, they also generate reduced T cell response, so that to also suggest a diminished infection. But also saying that maybe the kids have a really good innate immune response that effectively controls infection right at the site when it gets there. And so that in overall, the magnitude of the immune response was related to the severity of respiratory disease and also age. So the children, their reduced immune response suggests a more efficient, that they're more efficiently clearing this virus actually at the outset. They're not allowing that virus to get in there and establish a really disseminated infection. Um, and again, some of these, uh, the T cell work is, is ongoing. And we're also measuring, continue to measure antibodies in these cohorts to see how long that lasts as well. So now we get to the other side of this. So people, uh, you know, who are, uh, the immune response is severe COVID and also people who have died of severe COVID. So, so clearly this is our challenge. This is why we're all, the world's been paralyzed is because uh, a very, a significant percentage of, of individuals will develop this severe COVID. It's very hard to predict. Uh, it involves uh, lung damage, ARDS. Um, and so we need to understand what are the respiratory immune processes that are associated with severe disease. And those are occurring in the lung. When you have lung damage, there's only so much you can figure out what's going on in the blood. You really do need to look in the lung. As I showed in the beginning, it's those responses and the clearance in the lung that's getting rid of the virus in the lung. It happens in the lung. When you have protective T cell immunity, it stays in the lung. So what happens in the site is really important, which is why we need to define the respiratory immune processes that are associated with severe disease. So for this, we, uh, again, with Matt Baldwin and Tom Connors, we recruited patients who were intubated for severe COVID-19. And again, these were during the height of the pandemic. Um, uh, we did this for multiple ICUs, uh, both the PICU and multiple NICUs uh, that were also set up all over the hospital. And what we did was we, how do we get a sampling respiratory environment where all these patients are intubated? And this uh, tube is uh, flushed out with saline as part of clinical care to clear secretions. These saline washes are collected into sputum traps, and we collected that sputum trap as well as a paired blood sample daily for up to seven to eight days from patients who were in the ICU. Um, and again, our question is, what is happening in the lungs? So just to give you 
an idea of how the lung T cells are very different than the blood T cells. So the lung T cells, so you have airways here, um, you have TRM, both CD4 TRM that are around the airway, and CD8 TRM are actually in the intraepithelial space. So they actually are where, they are right next to the cells that could be potentially infected because they are poised to then kill those viral infected cells when they come in. So these TRM are those protective T cells that are in the lung. You don't have a whole lot of B cells in the lung, but you do have a lot of the other major cell type in the, in the lung, really the most abundant are these macrophages. And there's different types of macrophages, some are in the alveoli space, uh, some are in your airways. So these macrophages provide that first line defense, that innate immune defense, and they, they are there to protect the tissue. Now these macrophages and the TRM are not in blood. They don't come out into blood. What's in blood are monocytes, neutrophils, circulating T cells, and circulating B cells, and other granules, and red blood cells, okay? So what we wanted to understand is how the circulating immune response and the respiratory immune response are coordinating. What are these processes in severe COVID-19? And to do this, we did a variety of different, so we kind of did a deep dive in terms of our analysis of the immune cells in 15 patients um, where we collected these paired samples. So, so we had paired samples uh, from the airway and the blood. And for controls, we had controlled blood from healthy individuals um, and also controlled airway samples, which we uh, obtained from uh, lungs that we obtained from organ donors. We actually do our own um, bronchial barrage. And, and this is sort of non-disease lungs that we collect a wash from. Um, we had in this cohort 15 patients, eight of them died. They were of, of multiple ages, 14 to 84, and all the patients who died were older than 63. Uh, we did three different things, um, and I'm just going to show you some of the data. Um, we did a multicolor uh, panel to capture and analyze every type of immune cell that we were finding. So innate cells, adaptive cells, so we had all sorts of innate cells, macrophages, monocytes, neutrophils, dendritic cells. Uh, we had T cells, all sorts of T cell subsets, memory, naive, tissue resident, circulating, and B cells, um, and NK cells, and every, every cell we were able to identify. We also did single cell RNA-seq from four of these patients in collaboration with Peter Sims. Um, this is where you, you look at the transcriptional profile of every single cell. Um, and then we also did an analysis of the proteins and the cytokines and chemokines that were expressed in the airway and the plasma. And here are the different um, individuals. Uh, here's the number of paired samples. It varied depending, we, we tried to do seven to eight. Uh, sometimes we got fewer samples. That was usually because the patient died or was um, in some cases discharged. And so we did most, uh, the flow cytometry and cytokines for most all of them and, and single cell RNA seq for four of them. Uh, the exclusion was cancer immunosuppression and ongoing bacterial infection. So we wanted to make sure we we're looking at the antiviral immune response. Uh, again, we had uh, Matt Baldwin and Tom Connors uh, for uh, the patients. And then this was done, this whole uh, study is done by Peter Chavo, Pranay Dauber, Josh Gray, and Stephen Wells in my lab. They sort of worked all four of them together. Uh, this paper's in revisions on that archive as well. Um, so what we're able to do is look longitudinally and look at the immune composition in the airway and blood. And here are kind of the major, five major lineages. The red is a myeloid. The T cells are light blue CD4, dark blue CD8. And then we didn't have many of these cells or ILC, say, in the airway. This is comparison to a healthy airway. So a healthy area of mostly myeloid cells, uh, some T cells, and very few other cells. You can see for COVID, and this is an average from all of the people, um, that for each time point you had kind of variations in myeloid cells and variations in T cells, particularly CD4 cells, which were really at higher frequencies in the airway than in a healthy airway. For blood, um, here's the normal frequencies in blood. You have more T cells. If CD4s are more frequent than CD8s, then myeloid cells, that's about, those are mostly monocytes, so circulating monocytes in your blood. You also have B cells and some NK cells. So that, that's sort of the normal composition of the blood. But you can see it's completely flipped in COVID, so that there's many more monocytes, a much higher frequency of monocytes across the board, and then sort of outnumber T cells. Um, and so that's really quite different uh, then. So it was already, there's also some aberrations both in the airway and the blood. So what are um, these different cells and how do they correlate with outcomes? So does the composition in the airway and the blood correlate with outcomes? 
Well, I'll tell you, we looked at all of these different, so let's go to the major ones of myeloid C4. In the blood, it doesn't correlate with outcomes. This is deceased or survived. There's no correlation in frequency of the blood populations with survival. There's no correlation with age. You see that all of the older people, that all the people who died were older than 60. And the people who survived, most were younger. They were all younger, okay? But in the airway, there, it, there are some significant correlations. One is that there's a higher myeloid frequency of the patients in the airway of the patients who die, also correlated to age. So the older people had a higher myeloid frequency. And conversely, there was a higher frequency of CD4 in the airway in patients who survive, and again, a very strong correlation with age. So the younger people had higher C4s in the airway. So it was the airway that provided this correlation of association, even in the small cohort, but not the blood, suggesting that this should be, we really need to do this in a bigger cohort to see if we can identify a biomarker that may predict how well, now all these patients are severely ill, so may predict how well people who are severely ill um, may fare. Um, so let's look at just the T-cell, just to give you an overview. So what was different about T-cells in the airway versus, um, the T-cells in the airway, so uh, for COVID versus non-COVID, okay? See, this is just a pie chart of all the subsets. Um, and here's the TRM, here are the resident subsets. So you can see overall that there's some major differences in composition. But let's just break it down. What was, made, what was really different about the COVID airways is that there were a lot of activated uh, T cells. So activated uh, TRM and activated circulating uh, memory cells. So that there was a real, uh, you could detect that the T cells were being activated in the airway, which is really uh, consistent with what you find in animal models. When you have a respiratory virus, it's the T cells that are in the airway, and those who are responding um, that are doing that, trying to do that job of clearing the virus. And in this cohort, even as severely ill as they were, uh, the more CD4s they had in the airway, the better they seemed to do that, it seemed to be reflect that they were going to maybe survive this. Now, conversely, there is there are more regulatory T cells. I haven't really introduced it, but regulatory T cells are a subset of T cells. Uh, they're in healthy airway. Here's a percentage about 9% healthy airway, okay? They were reduced, but reduced significantly in the COVID airway. Regulatory T cells can help to control an over-exuberant response. They help mediate what we call immune homeostasis and prevent that immune response from going haywire. They were reduced in the airway, again, suggesting that what's going on in the airway is also due to immunopathology. So this is a T cell. But was even, it was even more striking with the myeloid cells. So now we're looking at all the different types of myeloid cells in COVID-19, and I'm not really showing you this. So the myeloid cells can be monocytes, which are circulating, and macrophages, which are in the tissue. These are innate cells. Their, their function is to, um, well, macrophages will engulf things. That's what they do. They're phagocytes. They're going to engulf anything like dying cells, foreign they'll engulf bacteria, and that's how they mediate that they be responsible, produce a lot of inflammatory cytokines. Monocytes are circulating and can become, become um, macrophages when they get into tissues and they also surveil uh, systemically. So if you look at the airway and blood, the populations, and, and the, kind of the different subsets is not, is not so important here. I just wanted to show you that if you look at, say, healthy blood and airway and the compositions of the macrophages, so in healthy Airway, you have this major population of airway macrophages and healthy blood. The predominant population is sort of classical monocytes that have high levels of class two. And you see this is just really turned around in COVID blood, um, particularly in the blood, where you have now all of a sudden you have almost completely different monocyte populations. This classical, kind of the healthy monocyte is really the minority here. You have all these average monocytes with aberrant phenotypes. In the airway, you have these airway macrophages, but now you have a lot of these other cells that are in the blood that you're now finding in airway. Again, suggesting that you're getting recruitment of these weird and aberrant monocytes into the airway. This is part of immunopathology. Immunopathology is when you have these aberrant responses uh, in that tissue, and you're recruiting more aberrant responses. So let's look at what's aberrant. The aberrant responses are in the, in the blood that you can measure in the blood. Um, you can see there's these aberrant responses, these monocytes in the blood. They're immature type of monocytes, suggestive of maybe some sort of emergency myelopoiesis. And the classical monocyte is really in healthy blood and you're not seeing COVID. So there's really 
uh, very striking changes to the monocytes and macrophage populations. Um, and what about what they're doing? Um, so to look at their it's inflammation. So you've heard about a cytokine storm, so you can measure a lot of these cytokines in plasma. So you see all these cytokines here. These are inflammatory interferon. Um, a lot of these are chemokines, MCP1, MIF1 alpha, MIF1 beta. These are chemoattractants. Uh, Granzyme B and perforin are T cell mediated uh, inflammatory cytokines. So here's a bunch of it, these IL6 is a major inflammatory cytokine that you can measure in plasma. It's, it's known to be highly elevated in all patients with severe disease. Here is the concentration of the plasma, and here are the paired samples from these patients, same patients in the airway. And you can see that there's much higher, there's a few different things. So there's much higher concentrations of certain of these chemokines, particularly these, ma these macrophage chemotractants uh, chemokines that are in the airway. Uh, this MCP1, MIF1 alpha, MIF1 beta. Some of these aren't even measured in the plasma, and also Gram-side B, not even and TNF alpha beta are not even in the plasma, but they're in the airway at high concentrations. Um, so that's one thing, is that you have this sort of focal focus of these highly inflammatory and chemoattractant chemokines in the blood, uh, in, the, in the airway that's not in the blood. So here's the corresponding in the blood. And then if you look at the paired analysis, and this is MCP1, also called CCL2, here's the paired analysis for all these different people, it's highly elevated in everybody's airway uh, compared to you don't even detect it in the plasma. And you can also measure, this is from single cell transcription profile, you can also measure it, that it's from macrophages. So this is single cell analysis of macrophages showing that the macrophages in these airways, so those inflammatory macrophages in the airway are producing this chemokine and they're recruiting those monocytes and suggesting they're going to recruit all these aberrant monocytes from the blood. So what's the evidence that, the, that we can really put this together? And so the evidence comes from the autopsies, from the people who did succumb. And so what we did here is we looked at, uh, within these lungs, either control a non-COVID lung that we obtained from organ donors. These were lungs that were from patients who didn't have infectious disease, weren't infected with SARS-CoV-2. And we looked at the um, where CD4 and CD8 were. And this is CD163. This is a marker for um, tissue macrophages, and also was expressed by many of the monocytes, these aberrant monocytes in blood. Uh, and so you find in the control, here's an airway, that you do have these tissue macrophages, and they're in the alveoli, like I showed that diagram, and the T cells, as I showed you in the diagram, the CD4 and CD8 are either in the airway or around the airway. So this is sort of your healthy uh, lung, and where T cells are situated, where these macrophages are situated. And then you can look even closer in the alveolus, and you can see this is where the pink, the pink macrophages are, okay? Uh, and you see this is a healthy alveolus, it's a lot, a lot of space. You need the space because they need a lot to breathe. Here's a COVID lung. Here's somebody who died of COVID-19 with diffuse alveolar damage. This is all people who had diffuse alveolar damage, so a lot of lung damage. Now all of a sudden you don't see or the any black spaces. They're filled with these CD163 monocyte macrophage populations. The T cells are sort of disrupted around. They're really not, you're not seeing that organization. When you look even closer, you can see that the T cells are there, the CD4 cells are there, but really they're overwhelmed by these um, monocytes macrophages with expressing 163. And if you look at, now you do a numbers. So we were showing you frequency for, with the images, we can actually look at numbers that the number of monocyte and macrophages in the COVID lungs was much significantly higher than the numbers and their, their um, organization in a healthy lung. Uh, CD4s, it was a little bit higher, but this didn't achieve significance. Um, and this is done by Stuart Weisberg and Anjali Saki in Department of Pathology. Um, so it appears that um, we have a model then for what might be driving severe disease. Um, that's really being driven through these, um, through the innate response that you have a lot of, so you have in the lung, you have T cells, these TRM that are trying to clear the virus, but at the same time, you have these macrophages that are dysregulated because they are producing a lot of this macrophage and monocyte chem chemotractic called CCL2. CCL2 is being produced at very high levels in the airway, and it's drawing in the monocytes. So monocytes express the receptor 
for CCL2, called CCR2. Didn't show you the data for it, but they do. We did check that. They do expect the receptor. So they are being driven out of the bone marrow before their time. They're not fully mature, so they're a barren. They're driven out of the bone marrow into the blood and then into the lung, so that the disease pathology is driven by this chemokine, this regulated chemokine axis, inflammation in the lung, drawing more inflammatory cells in the lung and promoting that damage. And the T cell just really can't do their job. Um, so just to summarize the respiratory immunity, and then I'll just finish up with some, um, just to, uh, to talk about the vaccine, that airway immune response is distinct from those in blood, and the immune cells of cytokine and circulation are partially or not really reflective of the infection site, but they really need to look at both to understand what's going on, so that the activated T cells are compartmentalized in the airway. Most of these are TRM, but that in terms of the disease process and pathology is both in the airway and the blood. So your inflammatory airway macrophage is producing CCL2 in the, in the airway, recruits more monocytes, and this may perpetuate bigger EPS. Um, so what implications does this work have, or these results have, is that targeting these airway responses may be important for treating and preventing severe COVID-19. There are these CCR2 antagonists um, that exist, these drugs. There was one uh, trial, I, I, it's sort of listed, I don't know where it is, the status of it, uh, to kind of block the... Uh, recruitment of monocytes to the airway, and also maybe promoting protection at the site to really enhance that TRM to prevent this uh, dysregulated, where the TRM maybe aren't clearing as well as they can, and setting up this dysregulated macrophage response. So just to finish up, um, we have a way out of this, uh, and a way out of this pandemic and a way out of preventing uh, illness and severe disease and mild disease, and that's through the vaccines. The current vaccines that are now being administered here at the near Presbyterian and anywhere else um, use an mRNA platform. This is a little bit unusual. This technology has been in place for many years, but it hasn't really seen the light of day in a licensed vaccine yet. Um, this is sort of the first licensed vaccine. So they have a lot of vaccines that use this platform, but they're not in wide use. This is one of the first that's, that's really seen wide use. And the advantage of it is that, it, first of all, it's easy to make these. So you have an mRNA, so you have the trend. It, it's actually not even the DNA. It's the, it's the intermediate between DNA and protein. Okay? It's the RNA. And it's really from this RNA, and you can put an RNA for any gene you want. So in this case, they're using spike train. But you can also manufacture these for any variants, for any protein, for any of the proteins you want. It's encased in a lipid nanoparticle, which is just uh, is how you can kind of get it into cells and get it into the cell membrane. These are very small. Uh, they don't really contain much. To, it's not like an inactivated virus like flu. You have to grow up an egg. So you have a lot of things with it. But this does it. It's very simple. So when you inject it, you have the mRNA for the spike protein that you inject. Um, you put it in the muscle, uh, the cells, it'll get to the cells, it'll make spike protein, and it triggers production of spike protein in the body, and the body will see this is foreign, and will make antibodies to it, and if it makes neutralizing antibodies, then you're protected. So the question is, does this work? So there's two different kinds of vaccines, the Pfizer, which may, if you've gotten in the Moderna, which others also have gotten, I think it's probably equal, and these were the trials, these were the results of the trial. The first trial was efficacy. So they do phase one, phase two. The phase three was an efficacy trial. Here are the here is the people. It was uh, twenty one over twenty one thousand who were vaccinated and twenty one thousand who got two doses. Twenty one thousand were in the placebo group, so they just got liposomes. Um, and here is the incidence of sorry, of, of COVID nineteen. Here's the placebo, and here is the vaccinated group. So this is perfect. This is just amazing. So you can see the placebo, they, many of them got infected, and here are the cumulative incidents of it. Uh, and, here, um, and here are the people who uh, were vaccinated. You have very few people got the illness who were vaccinated. And only about uh, one person got severe, there were only 10 cases of severe disease in this cohort, and only one of them was in the vaccine group, the other nine were here. And so this was really, this is like 90 to 90% efficacy. Moderna had a similar curve. Again, lots of people, um, 14,000 um, 14, in the placebo, over 14,000 in the vaccinated. Again, vaccinated hardly developed any disease, um, and the placebo did develop some disease. And they had more, um, 
more incidence of disease. And this just shows you at every each dose how many de develop disease. Um, and here are the references. So this was just published last month. I mean, this is really new. But this was enough. Um, I mean, it was published last month, but it appeared actually it was online further. And they did license the vaccine, and, and now many of you have gotten it and should continue to get it if you have it because it works really well. Um, now, what about the neutralizing antibodies? So this is another very recent study. So the, the efficacy does not depend on your immune assay. It's just sort of protection from disease, which is really the best way to, to look at efficacy. But you can see that in different cohorts between uh, young adults, uh, younger than 55 and older, between 65 and 85, they do develop that neutralizing activity. So this is a neutralizing titer like I showed you before. The older people have a little bit lower overall, but they do develop antibodies. So this bodes very well. Uh, that this vaccine is giving protection because it's generating neutralizing antibodies. So just to summarize um, that for COVID-19 um, and uh, that most individuals will generate robust adaptive immune responses consistent of virus specific T and B cells that last many months. Uh, the protective capacity of circulating T cells is not clear for respiratory viruses, um, but um, uh, the severe disease is associated with dysregulated inflammation, recruitment of myeloid cells. So TRM response is certainly associated with survival uh, so that the lung response can be protective, but we've got to look at the lung to figure it out. We can only do that in severe disease. Um, vaccines generate protective neutralizing antibodies, so they can mimic at least some of the protection that you get when you're from a natural infection. And again, that is a successful vaccine. If it gives you the protection that you'll get from the natural infection. So, so that's uh, this is so we have a path to end this pandemic. And everyone who's vaccinated blocks that virus. Blocks is one pure reservoir that that virus can infect. So you're protecting yourself and you're protecting others around you by getting vaccinated. And so this is just acknowledgement, all the people that were involved in this work, my laboratory, I mentioned all of you by name, uh, most everyone, um, and then all the different departments, uh, medicine, pediatrics, pathology, system biology, surgery, uh, that really uh, to do this kind of work requires just multiple collaborations. And I'd be happy to take um, questions. So are there questions in the chat? Okay. Um, I'll just read the questions. SARS-CoV-2 is mutating its variants appear more contagious. How do we beat the viral clock? Do our memory B cells evolve too? Okay, so um, a lot of these neutralizing antibodies actually cross-react with these variants. So um, when you're generating antibodies, neutralizing antibodies is not always the same and it's not always to one kind of part of you know epitope or, or amino acid. So changes in different amino acids, a lot of these are cross-reactive. So and then your T cells will be broadly cross-reactive. So you will probably pre be protected against many of the variants. However, um, with these vaccine platforms, they can rapidly uh, give you mRNAs for all sorts of variants. And I think ultimately, just like for the flu that we do trivalent or quadrivalent, so you're getting multiple flu strains uh, in the, uh, covered by the vaccine, I think that will eventually become our vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. Um, the second question is, why do some kids develop MISC? Why others are spared? Um, why does disease prevention vary across different persons? So MISC is highly rare in children. It's really very rare. We don't know why it develops, whether they're doing sequencing and trying to figure out whether it's a genetic component. There might not even be enough children to do that uh, statistically, but, you know, to find something. But, um, but that, that work is underway. It's underway here. Um, it's, it's not known, um, but that is easily treatable though. They found out early and that if you just give these, these children steroids, it actually cures them. Uh, and the follow-up about the heart, uh, they don't seem to have at least uh, from what we know, and I think you uh, refer to Brett Anderson about lasting consequences of cardiac complications. So they also seem to heal. Um, okay, somebody had asked about quarantining for three months following recovery. Um, who have recently recovered. Um, 
you think people recently recovered could become reinfected and remain symptomatic and transmit infection to others? I think that anybody who has a vaccine or has had the infection um, is going to, gen it, again, this protection is, is, is at least largely due to these neutralizing antibodies. If you're neutralizing the virus, if you're not enabling the virus to infect your cells, then the virus has nowhere to go. It can't replicate. If it can't replicate, you're not producing virus, so you're not infectious. So although we still need to, to there still needs to be studies on vaccinated people in terms of their transmission. We can say, I, I think just based on what we know about other vaccines, people who are vaccinated, uh, who are protected from disease, are likely not to be infectious. And if they are, it would be just a very brief period, a very low level. Um, we know that, we know data, here's another question. Um, when one gets vaccinated, how strict was it be in terms of wearing a mask and starting when? So when you are um, vaccinated, you still need to wear a mask. This virus, as you know, is still everywhere. Um, so you still need to wear a mask for, for until a lot of the population becomes vaccinated, at least till then. Uh, particularly in, in any, like the subway or where you're going. Um, about anaphylactic reactions to vaccines. Um, what about people with severe reactions to food? Are they going to be concerned by taking the vaccine? So here's what's different about other vaccines. So like influenza vaccine is actually a, an inactivated virus. And in order to grow up flu and generate the vaccine, you need to grow it up in a chicken egg. So there's always some, so people who are allergic to egg, they say, well, you know, you might have a reaction or whatever to flu. But this does not have any food components. This vaccine is just these liposomes, which are these little oily bits, which aren't allergenic at all. So they are not the kind of, of, of substances that cause allergy and a little RNA. So there's really very little uh, to react to. So having a food allergy does not at all predispose you to any kind of anaphylaxis to this type of vaccine. And there have been very few incidences of anaphylaxis to this vaccine. What are the differences in side effects in the Pfizer and Moderna? They say that there's fewer in the Moderna than the Pfizer. All the side effects are published, and a lot of them do include arm pain and ache, um, and you will get that also from the flu. And in my experience, was that it was much less than for the Moderna vaccine. I had pain for about a day and a half in my arm. For flu, I might have it for five days. Um, so you'll have some pain. Some people get fever. Some people get aches, but it's transient. It lasts a day and then you're done. And that means that your immune response is, 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 is it's a response, that's a good thing. It means that you're getting that innate immune response and you're getting a little response. It's self-limited because of vaccine, but you are mounting your immune response. Um, and another one, an elderly patient who has a mild case of COVID, how soon is it safe to have the COVID vaccine? Um, okay. Um, so if somebody's had COVID-19, uh, you should wait probably a few weeks to get the vaccine. They should still get vaccinated. Initially, they were telling patients like to wait 90 days. I think that was more because you're protected for several months, so you don't need the vaccine. So it's just a way of sort of stretching that they get vaccine dose. Um, but you can, after a month or so, uh, get that vaccine. You can boost that immunity and, and more. Some people are asking me about treatments. I can't really speak to uh, what kind of treatment. Somebody's asking me about whether you should give, if someone's diagnosed, whether you should give the monoclonal antibodies, those are general monoclonal antibodies. Um, uh, does depend on severity of symptoms. Again, that's more of a treatment question that I refer you to um, somebody who's an uh, infectious disease specialist. Um, let's see. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, because we're out of time. So thank you all for joining. Um, it was a pleasure to talk to all of you. Uh, sorry I couldn't see you in person, and have a great day.